7. How's everybody doing? This is JD Samo coming at you. And welcome! I hope everybody's doing good out there. And uh, I'm really glad to finally be able to be doing this. Um, you know, I went down <clears throat> with the virus uh, last week and I wasn't able to do this. So, you know, I'm really happy to finally be able to do it and um, really grateful to be back in action. I made a big batch of chili for me and my family and and I've uh, been hanging out, listening to records and playing some guitar and, you know, just really glad to finally be able to do this. So this is, um, this is... Uh, a little thing that I'm going to call guitarded, um, which is sort of focused on um, sort of teaching to a certain extent. And um, it's, um, you know, I'm going to choose different topics. A lot of people um, write me. And one thing I want to get out of the way right away, man, thank you so, so much. I mean, everybody was, the amount of uh, messages and text messages and private messages and all types of stuff uh, just really warmed my heart. It was, I was, felt very unworthy of it, and um, I really am grateful um, for all of the love. Because <clears throat> Lord knows there's a million people that are a lot worse off than I am. And um, I mean, it was no picnic, but it certainly certainly is. Um, I'm fine, you know, now. So uh, thank you very, very much, folks. And I hope and pray that, uh, that all you stay safe out there and everything is groovy in your world. So anyway, so guitarded. So... Um, um, this first episode, I want to, I mean, I'm going to talk about all types of different stuff over the course of different, um, episodes. And, um, uh, the main thing is, you know, cause some of these things that I'm going to do, uh, live stream wise are more performance based. And, um, I wanted to do something that's more geared towards, um, answering music questions and talking about playing and stuff like that and technical stuff at times and, you know, a whole bunch of different coast things. So, one thing that I wanted to start with here is the 10 records that made me, okay? Now, I want to preface this by saying that this is these are the 10 records that I picked, which was really difficult because I'm an audiophile. I collect records. I'm a voracious listener of lots of different stuff. I know a lot of people say that I, I am. And um, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on for, for God knows how long talking about the minutia of all types of different stuff. But these are 10 records that really the guitar player, the guitar player, not the artist. And so it's not 10 records that made me artistically. Those are, that's different. And also like personal, like Desert Island things, you know, that changes all the time. Um, that's not what these are. These are kind of the, the guitarists that I've become. These are 10 records <clears throat> and specifically you know certain songs certain motifs certain styles and stuff that have really made what i feel is who i am as a guitar player and so before i crack into them um there's a couple of honorable mentions that i wanted to talk about first first things first the the first two things that made me want to play guitar at like two and three years old was was booker t and the mgs and elvis presley and so i'm gonna actually talk about elvis presley in a minute um, but an honorable mention I want to throw out to to, to Steve Cropper um, because um, there isn't a Booker T in the MGs or a Steve Cropper uh, record in my top 10 here. And I mean, he was a huge part of me learning to play, um, you know, like the Soul Loader Green Youngins, you know. You know, it's one of the first things I ever learned to play in my life. And then the the uh, sitting on the dock of the bay answers, the... And so on. That That's all stuff that's really big in the formative... Um, formative part of me when I was actually learning to play. So, mad... Uh, love and respects out to Steve Cropper and Booker T and the MGs. And uh, similarly, another guy who is not necessarily on my list, but I wanted to give an honorable mention is the great Teeny Hodges, who is kind of like another version of, you know, Steve Cropper, Reggie Young, uh, Bobby Womack. You know, they were all part of the Memphis uh, hit team uh, at different studios in the 50s and 60s in Memphis. And Teeny um, 
in particular, and this stuff is really hard to play right, and I certainly don't claim to, but like, you know, him playing with Al Green in particular, like on I'm a Ram, you know. Stated and loose with his right hand. Also on uh, Love and Happiness. Mm -hmm. Love and Happiness. He hits that wood block with his foot. One, three. Mm -hmm. Just knocked me out. And so, and a million others. But, um, <clears throat> and there's another, there's a really rare, um, it's not rare, but I mean, it's just something I, don't, I never hear about. But there's a there's a song on um, the first Al Green album, the one that has I'm a Ram on it and Driving Wheel and Tired of Being Alone and all that. A song called Right Now, Right Now, which uh, Teeny's playing through the wah-wah and he goes, uh, let me do it right. Right now, right now, right now, right now. stuff where he would use the the his foot the the sound of the wah wah kind of in tempo <clears throat> really hard stuff to do he had a really he had just a great groove man you know teeny hodges we lost him a few years ago um but anyway he gets a big honorable mention freddie king big honorable mention he's not in my list here but uh you know obviously a big big thing for me curtis mayfield um the curtis live record um in particular um, big influence on my playing, huge, huge. And um, also Mike Bloomfield isn't necessarily in my top 10, but made a huge impact. The East West record in particular, when I heard of the Paul Butterfield Blues Band East West record, I heard it when I was 18 years old and it really kind of, I heard that and another record that is in my list here um, that really kind of shook things up for me. And so I know I wanted to give Mike a, a shout out here. And then last but not least, any and every Beatles record. Um, there was a good portion of my, when I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old, that's all I listened to was Beatles. And in particular, you know, John in particular was always my favorite guitar player, you know. had such a great rhythm my favorite um is um the intro to she's a woman you know uh john is just was just so funky man you know just you know that and oh there's all types of Beatles stuff I mean I was just I was a huge Beatles nerd <laughs> Just the some of the simpler stuff that just was like melody based, you know, like uh, just you know. I mean, I could go on and on and on and play a whole thing just on Beatles stuff. Um, but uh, in any rate, those are all honorable mentions that I kind of wanted to get out of the way before I actually get into the the top 10 here of uh, the records that made me as a guitar player. 
<clears throat> so um, the first record I want to talk about, um, and I'm also um, going to throw this throw this up here. Um, this is the uh, the Venmo and the PayPal. If you want to make a contribution to the JD Simo House for JD Simo, uh, thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead and throw this up there too. I'm getting all fancy on you. Check it out. So uh, anyway, the first record I want to talk about is this record right here, Elvis at Sun. Okay. So when I was four, three, four years old, saw Elvis on television. Um, he was. Uh, it was like an anniversary of his death kind of a thing, okay? And I was uh, obsessed with, uh, I was just obsessed with him. I was obsessed with him. I was obsessed with uh, Scotty Moore. I wanted to be Scotty Moore. And so how I learned to play guitar was this album, um, essentially. It was a million other things, too. It was a lot of other records, too. But the, the Elvis at Sun, these are the first things I ever learned to play. And um, it was really fortuitous, too, because it's, you know, it's the birth of rock and roll music. And so to kind of learn rock and roll in chronological order is something that I certainly didn't plan to do. It just kind of happened. And uh, it's been a really great way for me to kind of learn and soak and absorb stuff, you know. So Scotty. I got to know Scotty a little bit before he passed away, and it was one of the greatest joys of my life. Um, really great stories, and he shared a lot with me, the little bit of interaction I had with him. Um, got to go to his uh, birthday party one time up at Opryland, uh, which was a, a huge honor. Um, and um, also, there's a new Tom Hanks movie that's going to be coming out next year, um, an Elvis biopic where he's Tom Hanks is playing... Uh, uh, Colonel Tom Parker, and uh, anytime you hear guitar in that whole movie, it's yours truly. It's actually uh, the first big movie soundtrack score stuff that I've ever worked on, and it was been a huge, huge honor to get to work on it. And um, got to do not only Scotty Moore and all that, but but Carl Perkins and Sister Rosetta Thorpe and and uh, Muddy Waters and. Um, there's all types of really cool stuff that we've done for the movie, and I'm excited. Baz Luhrmann is uh, producing it and directing it, and he wrote it. So um, anyway, here's some stuff. The first thing that I remember really, Good Rockin' Tonight, just knocked me out, okay, with the... So that was one of the first things I ever learned. And uh, Baby Let's Play House um, had another really good one, which is the... Those two things, um, which are both on that record, and then of course, uh, like Blue Moon of Kentucky, uh, which uh, has this great, this sort of uh, bending a, oh God, it's bending a flat note. So it's uh, in an A chord. Bending into the major third, but it's 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 the flat third bending into it. That's so hip in the solo section, which is something that just knocked me out. So in Blue Moon, it's a
that up a little bit, but that that's something I learned, and it's it's that 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 rub that I love the most. And then uh, obviously that's all right, Mama. You know. Uh, other I remember I, lo I love you because where he's sort of trying to sound like Les Paul so all that stuff and then also the first solo I ever learned it's not on Elvis at Sun uh, but it's worth talking about the solo to Heartbreak Hotel, which I got to do in the movie, which was really fun. We actually, part one scene, I guess, in the movie is them recording Heartbreak Hotel. And uh, there's a common element in kind of all of the the things that have made a biggest the biggest impact on me. And the thing is, is that there's always a little nuance that usually gets lost in translation. If you listen to the real record, it's there. And it's part of what makes the whole thing so special or funky. But it's subtle. And so most of the time when people replicate it, it doesn't get replicated with the note or something. And I've noticed this about all these things that have made a huge impact on me. There's always some little nuance that I particularly would like discover or keep harping on it until I found it. And the reason why what I was doing didn't sound like the record. And it it's the things that make the biggest difference, those little nuanced things. And it's the things that you, it, it, they usually take a moment and they're usually not really that sexy, okay? They're usually kind of boring. And um, so with Heartbreak Hotel, I'll play it incorrectly first and then I'll play it correctly. So the way most people would play it and the way I've heard a million people play it in bars and stuff is this. Which is, which is incorrect. The right way to play it is like this. Microtone bend again, which he also did in in Blue Moon of Kentucky. That he also does in Heartbreak Hotel here, where it's you know it, where he's bending an E flat into an E, and that is so funky, man. I mean, it's just totally funky, but it's like it's something that like you hear it as like you know. You know, and it's like you, your your brain, like if you don't take the moment to sort of like deconstruct what's going on, you can like easily be like, oh, I got it and move on. <clears throat> but it's all the little things like that that really like make stuff right, you know. So Scotty Moore, I mean, I could go on. I'm going to try and keep this kind of like a bridge so we can keep moving here so I can get everything in in this episode. But um, the... Um, that's you know scotty moore big you know james burton later of course is is a big influence as well but not nearly as much as all of the stuff that scotty did in the 50s with elvis i mean everything the the, the intro to hound dog <laughs> i'm 
sort of paraphrasing there, but that style, I mean, just, you know, it was a huge part of my, my childhood, you know, and um, that's how I learned to play guitar. So Elvis at Sun, that's record number one. And uh, much love to Scotty Moore and his family. And, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for inventing the wheel because Lord have mercy. That's as, as groovy as it gets, you know. So, uh, on to the next record. And um, the next record we got is this one right here. This is Earl Hooker's Two Bugs and a Roach. Um, now, I didn't get hip to Earl Hooker until I was well into my teenage years. And uh, I'm in my early 30s now. And um, as a slide guitar player, the first kind of biggest influence I had from slide guitar was Dwayne Allman and uh, still is a huge influence but there's sort of something that happened um, at a certain point with me in particular and it's only been in the last few years really where just the way that Earl phrased just has resonated with me more and I think partially it's because there's so many people out in the world that kind of approximate Dwayne's style so well um, that I kind of inherently am kind of uh, more attracted to things that are maybe less uh, uh, that I hear that I maybe hear reference to less you know I don't know that could be part of it but uh, Earl was uh, was great and he always played in standard tuning um, which is what I do um, and um, his style is sort of more a more refined Muddy Water style, because you know Muddy was real, had real wide vibrato and I can't even do it really well because that's just not the way I play. But you know, basically, Earl had a very refined Muddy style. You know. He sort of, uh, he wiggles around, you know, obviously it's all pentatonic, you know, but it's, but, and it's in standard tuning, but he just has this beautiful, it's very, um, Dwayne's is more aggressive, you know. And, Is, is chiller and not not nearly as aggressive, you know. And the other thing that he was really into is he really was into like the like devices of the day so you know he loved wah-wah pedals so there's a there's a, a tune on on uh, two bugs and a roach called wah-wah blues you know And there's, you know, there's funny ones like Tug Two Bugs in a Row, where he's, you know. But it's just, you know.
you know, there's a lot of compendiums um, out there about Earl Hooker because um, there isn't a, a ton of recorded stuff of him that even exists, you know. So, um, but that's just what I direct everybody to. And when I heard that record uh, when I was a teen teenager, it hurt, it made a huge impact on me. And and um, um, now I would say that he's probably a bigger influence. He's probably my biggest slide guitar influence by far. And uh, um, I just love him. You know, I just think he's great. He's one of my favorite things that I listen to all the time. So, um, so that is that. So moving on to the next record. Um, this is Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. And uh, this is a, a huge, huge mind fuck of a of a record that um um I, I will preface this by saying i don't in any regard consider myself a jazz musician um i uh i flirt around in it um from time to time um because i do have a a, a pretty decent uh harmonic base of knowledge and uh chordal knowledge and um, um i really like harmony uh, especially Odd Harmony, which is <clears throat> why I love this record so much. But uh, I should kind of back up like the history of, of Bitches Brew um, for those that aren't aren't aware, I'm sure many are, that, you know, Miles had already kind of birthed two different phases of his career in the 50s and then in the early 60s um, and already had a succession of the greatest musicians in the history of music already in bands of his, you know. And so we're getting into the late 60s here, you know, the concept of someone like Miles completely reconfiguring everything um, in which he existed and had created and been successful and influential um, is a very oft uh, talked about but um, unattainable uh, mission for an artist to achieve. Uh, you know, people like Neil Young and Bob Dylan and um, Joni Mitchell and, uh, you know, there's only a handful in the history of of, of music that have kind of attain, uh, attempted, attempted those kind of things and not only attained them, but in some cases done them multiple times over, which is just incredible. And um, with Bitches Brew, you know, Miles was dating a lovely lady by the name of uh, Betty Davis at the time. And Betty um, had dated Jimi Hendrix. And uh, Betty, uh, there's a great record you should all check out that's called They Say I'm Different, if you haven't heard it. Um, it's her basically backed by, uh, was it Greg Errico, the drummer from Sly and the Family Stone, and Larry Graham, the bass player. It's just the funkiest record you've ever heard. And uh, she was awesome, and I'm a huge fan of hers. But anyway, Miles was dating her, and Miles was getting turned on to Hendrix and Frank Zappa, and um, Betty was sort of hipping him to what was going on in popular music at the time. And so Miles, by his own accord, you know, collected this group of young musicians, um, uh, a very young Chick Corea, uh, Dave Holland, bass player and a very young John McLaughlin and uh, Ayerto who's my favorite the, uh, the percussionist um, and, and a host of, of about four or five other guys and basically electrified funkified psychedelic Miles's approach to improvisation and so the whole kind of the I'm not really going to attempt what it is that they do because I can't but you know it's just that
uh, with Jack Dejanet playing drums and that kind of pulse of that that kind of pulse R and B influenced with 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 crazy at times dissonant improvisation over the top is a gigantic gigantic influence on me and I've listened to this record a million times and the phrasing in particular is what kind of made the most impact um, when I'm improvising and I'm sort of flowing and breathing um, the sort of that kind of phrasing is very drilled into my brain and there's another great performance that I steer people towards from this era. And uh, when Miles played the Isle of Wight Festival, that performance is probably my single most favorite, one of my, probably of, of anything. Um, I've watched that a million times. And the energy, as well as the intention is off the chart and it's kind of like you know miles gets up at this festival and it's like he's surrounded by the who and 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 um jimmy hendrix and all these other rock people hundreds of thousands of people and it's like miles and them get up to just destroy and they do and it is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And so, anyway, I have to put it on here because it's just a huge part of what it is that I enjoy doing. Um, and it's a huge part of the foundation of uh, what a lot of things, phrasing-wise, when I start to uh, go out, as it were, you know, the phrasing part of this. Um, n not in a linear sense, you know, not in a kind of... <laughs> Not in a linear sense, but in a kind of a... Like if you're, you know, if the, if the pulse is... me to describe because it's just kind of happening but it's a big 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 influence on me and like I said I don't consider myself a, a jazzist by any stretch of the imagination I'm a R&B rock and roll guitar player um, who loves this stuff how's that so um, that's that one big one and this next one I mean these are all really big but this next one is I don't know how many millions of times I've listened to this, but this is Funkadelic. This is their first album, George Clinton. And it's mostly a host of, it's before the actual band Funkadelic was completely formed. So it's a lot of the session guys from Motown who are actually on this album. And um, I just love this record so much. I've just, uh, I've really, really worn it out. And it's it was easy for me to pick because as much as I love uh, uh, Maggot Brain, which came out uh, two records after this, I believe, this is my favorite album by, by and without any stretch of the imagination. And um, it's... Like just like Bitches Brew and a lot of other records on this on this list, um, it was kind of lambasted um, at the time it came out and was ridiculed and and uh, and it wasn't um, it wasn't 
uh, very successful. And um, the critics kind of panned this record. And I just love that. I just think that's funny that so many records that are so important to me have that in common. Um, but uh, in any in any rate, uh, I want to take a moment to talk about the great Eddie Hazel, who's a huge, huge influence on me as a guitar player. And uh, there's a couple of songs on this record in particular. Um, uh, <laughs> It is just the coolest thing. And then later on in the, the record, there's uh, What is Soul. What is Soul? I don't know. Soul is the ring around your bathtub. I just love it. It's just the greatest thing ever. <clears throat> and um, this whole album, the one thing, um, again, like, you know, I'd heard lots of different psychedelic music. And then when I finally heard Eddie Hazel, I just loved the way he played, you know, because it was like, it was, it was, it was, it was Hendrixy, but it was more R&B. Like it was, it was, it was a little um, less rock and a little more, R&B, but using fuzz tones and reverbs and and uh, delays and and um, wah wah pedals and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and obviously Maggot Brain is a huge a huge influence too, but the first this first funkadelic record is as as big as it gets, um, as big as it gets for me, folks. So, at any rate. Um, and those two tunes in particular, I got a thing and what is so my favorites, but I bet you is a great tune too. I mean, I love it all. And so that is going to actually precursor into this right here, which I've, I've talked about a million times, which is uh, hot buttered soul, Isaac Hayes. Um, the great, my buddy, Michael Tolls, who signed my guitar down here. Um, Michael Tolls work on this record, um, is my favorite. It's just my favorite because it is psychedelic music played by R&B guys. It's just my favorite. And so from, you know, the the first steps of uh, of uh, uh, the first tune, Walk On By, you know. <laughs> ridiculously great fills played by the great Harold Bean who also was from Motown who played on the last Funkadelic record you know <laughs> like what Freddie King would do, you know, Freddie would do it, you know. But 
both Harold Bean and Michael Tolles would do it as well. And I just like, and it's something that I'll do sometimes in the middle of something. And Adam, who's played drums with me forever, he knows what I'm quoting, and so it'll make him laugh. You know, he'll he'll know that I'm quoting Michael Tolles. You know, and so um, another song on Hot Buttered Soul is uh, is hyperbolic. <laughs> And uh, I do a version of this, but the original, you know. played you know michael was again you know kind of like teeny hodges you know just a really good groove and it's real simple but it's really hard like just try and do it correctly where you don't sound stiff and you don't sound you know all choked up you know and i should also say with michael there's a couple other things that i heard later on a hot buttered soul was the big kind of pivotal record for me that really kind of helped change my life but there was a live record he made with Isaac called Live at the Sahara, and there's a lot of extended soloing on that. And you can hear, you know, I mean, he would use fuzz tones and and tape echo and wah-wah pedals and stuff, and you can just hear, you know, like, you know... <laughs> you know he jams out i mean it's just he's it's just a big part of where i'm coming from you know inherently where he where he was coming from so this next record um when i was 18 this is a record that i heard that um along with the east west paul butterfield blues band record basically kind of took me from being a relatively un remarkable sort of Stevie Ray Vaughan influenced um and I love Stevie Ray Vaughan don't get me wrong but when I heard this record I never listened to Stevie again um this is the first Fabulous Thunderbirds record Girls Go Wild came out on Tacoma in uh, 78 or 79 and when I heard Jimmy's playing it just um not everybody gets it, um, which is baffling to me, but I got it big time. And um, it just killed me from the first song, you know, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of B.B., Freddy, Magic Sam, Buddy Guy, sort of amalgam. Just beautiful phrasing and beautiful time.
there's a lot of tunes on this record. Uh, Rich Woman's one of my favorites. <laughs> Time lover. can't speak enough about how important this record was to me and um, it was a big part of my sort of leap forward into embracing um, older stuff that I knew about and had the records but they just hadn't grabbed me like rock and roll records had up to that point and I think a lot of that has to do with you know it's not this approach to playing R&B you know to playing blues um you know, it's not as sexy. I mean, it's sexier, but it's not as flashy. And so it's man's music, really. You know, it, it t it's more mature music. It's not, um, it's not as ring of fire rodeo winning. It's more slow burn, which is harder. Let me tell you folks, you know, like, at least from my experience, it's way harder to do, to slow down and say something with meaning than it is to play a whole bunch of shit. And I've done both. <laughs> so so anyway, that record, can't say enough about it. And everything Jimmy has continued to do since, um, he's a big, big influence on me and um, will always be. And uh, very grateful that he's in the world because... Uh, He's him and Anson Thunderbird, who's a, another dear friend of mine. You know, those are the really the last two cats that really can do it. You know, it's kind of extinct in the world except for those two guys, you know. So this next record, which is another really important album, um, has two covers. So I'm going to show you this is the original cover. And the album's called Blues is King as B.B. King from the mid 60s and that's the the cover that i know from when i was a kid but this is sometimes um a more uh readily findable version of the cover so just so you have both covers um i'll put the old one back up and so blues is king is from i think around 66 or so it's a couple of years after live at the regal i had live at the regal don't get me wrong live at the regal huge influence on me as is my kind of blues as is singing the blues from the 50s but this album in particular is one that i found when i was i don't know probably 11 or 12 years old and it just there's two songs on it in particular the, the his version of nightlife um which i do from time to time um and the the version of don't answer the door is um both of those are just amazing just bb at his absolute pinnacle of emotive power um there's got had to be something going on 
the night that this was recorded. This was recorded at the International Club in Chicago, my hometown. And um, there's just something emotional more than the average night. I, I, I wish I could know what was going on the night this record was made. <coughs> because um, in nightlife in particular, it's just insane. Um, the amount of mo emotive, like BB's going through something. And so, um, you know, I've talked many times about um, my love of BB King, but I, I can't talk about it enough. I mean, it just really is, you know. <laughs> That's an E flat. That's what uh, nightlife is in. Uh, don't answer the door is in C sharp, which is probably my favorite key to play in. If you ever wanted to know. But just the whole thing. It's a whole set from the International in Chicago, and it's just. A little more intense, a little bit more raw than Live at the Regal, and was a bigger impact on me just overall. You know, uh, the announcer brings him out, you know. <laughs> So uh, we're getting towards the end of my list here. I'm going to throw this one up because this one had another really big impact on me. Lightning Hopkins. I talk about him a lot. And uh, huge influence on me from Houston, Texas. 
And um, Lightning Strikes is my favorite album. I got it when I was a kid, and I still have it. And um, it's a, uh, a very haunting record. There's a lot of tape delay on it, and it's a very moody record. Songs like uh, Devil is Watching You and Walking Around in Circles is... Um, you know, it definitely sounds like you're listening to a haunted house, you know. And um, Lightning Style is, um, you know, he played with his thumb all the time with a thumb pick. The thumb is the biggest part of, of playing the Lightning Hopkins style. Throw away the pick for this, you know, because it doesn't sound right when you play with a pick. It needs to be loose. And so uh, the Lightning Boogie kind of thing, you know. Where he's accenting with the upbeats like that, like a piano player, and then going to the four chord and doing that cool. And doing sort of accents up at the octave. He would do these wild, you know, so. is he would always play in the second position right here. So he's playing an E a lot, e, usually E, A, C sometimes. And uh, he, uh, first of all, the way he phrased is he never bent notes because he's playing acoustic guitar. So, you know, there's no, none of that shit. You know, you got to play, got to go up to the note, you know. And playing in second position like this. Which is kind of not what you're normally used to. You're used to... You kind of got to program yourself. Of different tunes, but the, <clears throat> the lightning style is a big one for me, and um, I just love listening to them. Um, there's some really great um, live on Spotify, there's some really great live stuff of him <coughs> from the Newport Folk Festival that's particularly really great. Some really great YouTube videos of him, of course. Um, but lightning strikes is where I would point you point you to first. That was the one that got me when I was a little kid, and uh, has remained a big thing for me um, well into adulthood. Even though I'll never grow up because I'm a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> so, so um, that just leaves one album. Any guesses? Electric Ladyland, Jimmy. I mean, there's just nothing you can say, you know, it's, he was, uh, he was as revolutionary as a, as a musician, as he was an artist, 
as a writer. I always say, you know, he, uh, you know, he he had the he had the impact on the instrument of of a Miles Davis or a Chuck Berry, and he made also and he also made Beatle level albums. <laughs> um, and there's a difference, you know. There's a difference between um, amazing, uh, virtuosic, in, you know, musicians and artists. And uh, Hendrix was both. And on top of all of that, he was this incredible performer, you know, like James Brown or um, Little Richard or, uh, you know, like years later, you know, people like Prince or Michael Jackson or something, you know, like he, you had this, he knew how to perform. He knew how to do that as well. Um, complete, complete alien. And um, I love a lot of stuff that he did. Um, I love the stuff he was working on right before he died a lot. Um, you know, I love, uh, you know. I love Freedom and Dolly Dagger and In From the Storm. And I just love the funkiness of it. And I also really love Band of Gypsies. But Electric Ladyland is just always still to this day the record that, you know, if I am going to listen to a Hendrix album or something, it's the one that I'll put on to listen to the whole thing. Because it's just everything. And uh, it's probably my, fav my favorite song of his ever, you know. Have you ever... Wait, wait. Have you ever been... Have you ever been... To Electric Lady Land. That's my favorite. It's my favorite song he ever did. Is that one? I want to close my eyes and hear that. Hear that playing. Um. Other tunes on this record. Um, not Voodoo Child, Slight Return, but Voodoo Child with Stevie Winwood. You know. <laughs> Hopkins and Earl Hooker and all that stuff a lot, Muddy Waters. So, you know, him taking it to, to Mars. I love it. What can I say? And uh, I love Merman, I Should Turn turn the Tides and 1983 and Merman, I Should Turn to Be. And I love all that stuff. It's just, it just makes me happy. So, um, that's the 10... Uh, albums that made me as a guitarist and um, I'm going to be putting up a playlist on Spotify this evening and uh, this video is going to be archived on YouTube if you want to go back and watch it um, and if there's any specific questions about uh, anything I've talked about please either direct message me or just comment and I'll get to them in the next episode I hope you've enjoyed yourself and I hope that uh, some of this has at least been somewhat entertaining and um, and uh, hopefully I've hipped you to some stuff that maybe you weren't weren't as into or aware of um, and um, really appreciate you and I appreciate you being taking the time to watch and uh, I'm just gonna jam out a little bit and uh, I'll catch you next time okay thank you very much and again if you want to donate to the house of JD Simo house for J for way with JD Simos you know the information is there on the bottom. And uh, otherwise, I hope to see you all again soon. And uh, much love to you, okay? <laughs>
Thank you. 